Joining me now is a man fresh off of a monster KO win. He is uh, joining us all the way from, I believe, Perth, Australia. So much to talk to you about the win itself over Matt Schnell, his style, the whole nine yards. It's Steve Ursig. Steve, how are you? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me. Uh, Steve, the nickname Astro Boy. Help me out. Where does that come from? Um, it's honestly not a very good story. It was just we we're sort of brainstorming nicknames, and um, my coach's girlfriend at the time just sort of blurted out, oh, "What about Astro Boy?" And everybody seemed to like it. I kind of looked a bit like Astro Boy, so um, yeah, it stuck. That's it. Wait, wait. You gotta, you gotta, you have to help the American here. Who, who is Astro Boy? Oh, so it was an old cartoon. Um, uh, I think it was like made in the sixties or something. So he's like half robot, half human or whatever. He was like, yeah, okay. some scientist experiment thing, and he went out and saved people in his underwear. All right, and it just stuck. Everyone seemed <laughs> to like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know why, but yes. All right, fair enough. Hey, man, how are you feeling after that win? Uh, that was superb. I, I'm, I'm going to guess that that fight went more or less the way you thought it might, right? Yeah, hundred percent, it did. Um, I was. I'm always trying to make sure that I'm not expecting, like, especially with Snell, because he has been hurt in the past. I was trying to, in my head, not expect to knock him out. So I'm trying to go in my head, oh, just touch him. Don't try to force the knockout. Um, you might have to go three rounds, all this sort of thing. And then um, even the way I did knock him out, where I sort of, I didn't follow up with anything. I just walked away. Um, that I It did envisage that just because after I talked to him at the Wayne, he was such a nice guy and, I thought, well, if I don't have to hit him again, I really don't want to. So um, I did have in my head that I'd watch just for a second. And if I, um, if he did look completely gone, I'd just yeah, leave him be. All right. So <clears throat> there's so many questions I have for you related to what I've picked up from you. And uh, okay, so let me, let me lay it out. When you developed your style, were you consciously thinking about, hey, here's what I think would be really good for winning or was it more I'm picking up things that I like to do. These are things that are successful. I'm just going to ride that. And I guess what I'm asking is to what extent is your style an intentional byproduct of a thought process or an idea? Um, honestly, my style is mostly built because I wanted to be as good at every aspect of the sport that I could be. So um, my coach, for striking was a Muay Thai coach or uh, yeah, Muay Thai fighter. So a lot of my, although I do do it like a, mostly boxing at the moment, I do have those kicks there and that is something that um, will sort of start shining through. But I want to be super well-rounded and obviously starting with kicks too early against um, the competition at Flyway, I think it's just you are susceptible to getting taken down and that sort of thing and losing time uh, during the round that you don't necessarily need to lose. So not throwing naked kicks is what we call it. So making sure there's a setup. Um, and I didn't quite find the timing for those in that fight, but the boxing was working. And then, yeah, wrestling and jiu-jitsu. I really try to delve deep into not just wrestling and jiu-jitsu for MMA, but like really figure out them by themselves because I think it's important that everybody else is doing the same thing, right? They're trying to develop wrestling and jiu-jitsu for MMA. So if I can find something that I can add that's a little bit different because I've really delved into the sport by themselves, um, I might have an advantage there. So just yeah, trying to be the best I can at everything. Okay, uh, fair enough. And I'm not <clears throat> suggesting that you don't have a well-rounded skill set, but I guess the thing I wanted to focus on, given the way that the last fight went uh, in particular, because it's also a bit of a hot topic in MMA now, is kind of the boxing side of MMA. Um, yeah. Why do you think there is so much focus? Because there's focus around, uh, for example, your win was one part of the conversation. Ilya Teporia's win over Alexander Volkanovsky is another one. Max Holloway, people talk about it. Dustin Poirier, people talk about it. Who's the best boxer? Boxing and MMA, Adrian Yanez. Why is there so much focus, it seems like in the last year or so, on that particular skill set inside of MMA? I think in any um, combat sport, uh, the progression goes in waves. So people identify what the biggest weakness in the sport is, and then you see everybody sort of progress to fix those gaps. Um, and in jiu-jitsu, it's the most obvious. Leg locks 
exploded for a while and now you see that going away and like um, wrestling up and wrestling is sort of starting to become the meta in jiu-jitsu at the moment so i think the boxing and like specifically defensive like where your hands are defensively and um yeah setups and that sort of thing was a big hole for a long time and so people are starting to close the gap and because they've seen how effective it is everybody else starts to emulate that and then soon enough people get to a level where it's less exploitable and you'll see something else become sort of the meta so it's in other words you believe it's sort of more a function of this sort of gradual process of whack-a-mole like we'll fix this thing then another one pops up we'll fix that thing but i guess I, my question is more about like um why there is that hole to begin with like why boxing works inside mma now is it you kind of alluded to it right is it is it about the fact that people don't move their head enough or their hands aren't high enough there's just not a lot of what defensive responsibility what why does boxing seem to work right now so well i mean i can just uh attest to like my defense for instance like i've gotten away with like pulling a lot and that i think is a very common thing in mma because you're working so many things defensively staying in the pocket and like moving your head and all that sort of stuff because people are worried about knees and head kicks and all that sort of stuff that was maybe neglected for a long time and so you do have these big overreaching defensive movements that the majority of MMA guys are doing so what i've tried to do and which i think you are also seeing is you're having those people that are getting really good at slipping and rolling and getting under in, inside of those punches but they've adapted it slightly for mma where they're not as susceptible to knees and not as susceptible to kicks as they were and so the people that are starting to develop that are starting to have more and more success. Yeah, I was going to say, there have been <laughs> boxing coaches in MMA, but they never really seem to have... They had an effect offensively, right? Like, for example, George yeah. St. Pierre training with Freddie Roach. He got a great jab out of that. I mean, he had a good one before, but, you know, he got, he got tightened up or something. But that's strictly offense. It's the defensive side where everything seems like... the Or, or defense to offense, slipping and then throwing a punch, right? So those are those are the biggest areas where you can, if you can have an effect there, you can do a lot, it sounds like. Yeah, of course. Um, the closer you can be to somebody when you make a miss, the more effective your counter strike is going to be. And so um, as you're saying, like offense, there's been a big improvement of offense through boxing coaches. Because of that offense um, getting better, it causes people to get better defensively. Um, so yeah, just I think a product of better training partners, better competition, all that sort of thing. Are are you one of the MMA fighters that actually watches MMA? And the reason why I ask that is because <laughs> it's amazing, right? Like I like <laughs> may, maybe one out of every three will be like, dude, I don't even watch the sport. So I have to preface it with that. Do you watch uh, MMA in that way? Yeah, I do. I still feel like I'm just a big uh, MMA fan that's happened to be thrust into the the realm of um like all these other cool fighters so i'm like still starstruck and oh my god that's cody garber oh my god this is this person i don't feel like i should be there almost it doesn't feel real i guess uh, well you're top 10 in the ufc now so <laughs> I, it's pretty real let me yeah. stick with the boxing thing for just a little bit more um taking yourself out of the equation Who's got a good adapted boxing game for MMA? Who who do you, we just saw Jack De La Maddalena, right? Fellow fellow Aussie there. He he did a phenomenal job. Who else out there do you think does a really great job mixing that in? I mean, I hate to say it, but Ilya Tapuria is doing it amongst the best at the moment. Um, there's so many guys in the lighter divisions, like um, Adrian Yanez and uh, Rob Font. There's a lot of like guys who got really tight slick boxing at the moment um but yeah i think i think the best just because i know how good he is is jack Della. um he looks good when you watch him but to feel it is like a whole nother thing it's, yeah he's pretty good what, what do you mean you you uh, to what extent uh, have you felt yeah we, like i yeah so we he obviously takes a pretty light with me but um just the way he manages distance, I feel like, oh, I can hit him now. He's he's right there, and then he just out of the way. I'm like, uh oh, I'm in trouble now. And um, even his guard is because with MMA gloves, there's so many holes there. But he's so good at just catching, catching, catching. It just yeah, it's it's uh, frustrating to spar, and I'm glad he's in a much higher weight class than I have to fight him in. Yeah, I was gonna <laughs> say there's a bit of a difference there. 170 versus 125. Yeah. You got to take it easy there a little bit, right? 
<laughs> yes, he definitely has to take it easy on me. Uh, okay, and the the win itself, right? Um, you, you, against Matt Schnell, we talked about the KO before, uh, but in terms of like what it does for you, there's an interesting conversation to be had now. I'm, I, you may have seen it at this point. We're talking now on a. I'm not sure. Whenever I talk to someone in Australia, they're always in the future. But right now here in the, in the United States, it's still Tuesday. And yes. we're coming off of UFC 299. And the weight class champion uh, for your division, Alexandre Pantoja, was like, yeah, listen, these guys, who the, the, the sort of the, the names that we thought were going to be there aren't there. He's, and one of the names he said he could fight was you, Steve Ursig. Mm. I wonder yep. what you made of, make of that. Oh, I mean, first of all, it's awesome that he knows who I am just because – if he doesn't know who I am, it's very unlikely that I'm getting a shot anytime soon. But if you look at the division, it's there's only really two guys that seem healthy and ready to go at the moment. It's me and Makayev. So obviously, I'd love to fight him as soon as possible, Pantoja, that is. Um, but yeah, we'll just see what happens. I'm ready to go. In, in terms of like, um, I, I, there's never one right answer, I'm guessing, but I would love to know your perspective, which is I've seen the, the predominant, UFC fighter mentality is if you get offered a title shot, take it, right? But there has to be some kind of way in which you can get the most optimized time. And I wonder how you feel about that. Like if they came to you, I'm going to guess you would say yes. But I wonder if if you knew you could get it later, would you take it later? Um, so... I have made it very clear that anywhere, anytime, anybody. So just based on that principle alone, doesn't matter when they ask me, I'm going to say yes to the title fight if they ask. Um, obviously, you want, oh, I want 12 weeks, I want three months, I want, like, that's ideal. But I'm, yeah, I'm not the guy that's going to say, even if I was guaranteed after three, like, after I miss this one, I get three months, whatever. I'm going to say yes now. Just that's the way I am. No no questions about like um your development as a fighter like I I do you feel like everything is where it needs to be to be able to compete at a championship level. And the reason I ask this is because like you, you would be surprised how many times I have talked to someone and they're like, "Well, I will take it because if I don't, this train's not coming back around again." It's never a question of, did I develop my skills to a level where now is the appropriate time to cross that, you know, that, that threshold? I definitely think I can hang right now. I think all my skills are good enough that um, not only can I compete, but I can win, um, win that fight. And I don't like the mentality. It's like, well, if I don't take it now, or so yeah, if I have to take it now, cause it might never come back. If I think I'm good enough, um, if I didn't take it now, I'm getting there anyway. Um, if I lost right now, I'm going to get back there. I, I really, truly believe that I'm the best in the division. And if I do believe that, why wouldn't I take it? Uh, talk to me about Pantoja. Um, imagine I've never seen him. Size him up for me. What, 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 is, what are the threats? What's he good at? I think the best thing he got is the like sheer determination. Like, he... Even when he was tired, I think in the Moreno fight, he looked like he was exhausted after the second round, but he just kept going and he eventually made Moreno tired too. I mean, he does that to a lot of people. So I think the determination he has is number one. And then second to that is his jiu-jitsu. Mostly on the back, he is very good at scrambling to the back. And once he gets there, he can finish over your face. He can finish with a crank. He can finish on your neck. Like He's just so good at um, finishing the choke. From that position um obviously he scrambles really well and his striking although looks ugly he manages to land he has some good power there but he does lunge and reach and uh get very reckless on the feet and that's especially one area where i think i can take a lot of advantage of and um yeah take him out you know it was um what's kind of interesting <clears throat> about uh, Australia is like, dude, I remember when it was Elvis Sinisek, right? The king of rock <laughs> yeah. and rumble. And it was just him, yes. dude. And now it's like, it's just the, the level of talent is extraordinary, but getting to the jujitsu part, obviously you've got, um, well, he, I guess he's basically an American now, Craig Jones, but there, you know, there's obviously many, many more great grapplers out of Australia. 
to what extent do you feel confident in your uh, grappling to not just survive against him, but to thrive in any kind of condition? As, because as you mentioned, the backpacking, the relentlessness, this is a, this is a potent formula so far. Yeah. I mean, I put myself in bad positions for a long, long, long time. Um, so I'm very confident that if he gets on my back, I can defend and escape that position. I think if I'm on top, I'm in, I'm in trouble for anybody. Um, I've had a lot of good people try to choke me out and I've rolled with a lot of good people with my size bigger than me or whatever. So I'm very confident in my abilities on the ground. Yeah. It, uh, outside of, um, well, I'm not sure how to ask this question. Outside of the boxing in MMA, what do you feel like are is your number one strength? So not counting that, the thing that you just won with, what would you say is like your best skill? Yeah. My my jitsu I think is the best technically. I think um if you broke that down further, I think my ability to scramble is probably probably my best attribute, um, even in jiu jitsu. But yeah, my jiu jitsu is definitely the best. I've in Australia, my wrestling sort of stood out, but on the highest level, I don't think my wrestling is anything special. Um, but my jiu-jitsu, I think, is definitely my best attribute. When you say uh, in Australia, did you wrestle competitive? I mean, you have to forgive me about any information missing in your bio. You wrestled competitively yeah. prior to MMA? Um, no, during MMA. So I've been... Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, I, my biggest achievement for wrestling was I won a national championship in wrestling. Um, but yeah, just on in the MMA scene, in general, my wrestling seems to be one of the best in Australia. And, and, and getting back to Pantoja, I wonder, like, you know, he had that just, I mean, he's had a couple of dog fights here, you know, recently. Um, to what extent, like, if you got him, I, and I know the answer is going to be, well, I'm not counting on this because I have to count on the best guy, but like, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a tax to be paid for that. Is there not the amount of like, just, you know, blood and guts fights he's had? Yeah, of course it's a toll. I don't think... He's been like cracked a lot. Like Moreno probably did the best job at hitting him hard. I think Roval, even though it looked like he was landing near the end of that fight, he was mostly hitting the guard. He couldn't really find his way through. Um, so I think the Moreno fight more than any. And then his other fights prior to that, he didn't really take that much damage. He ran through quite a few people. The Manel Cape fight, he didn't take a whole lot of damage, even though it was three rounds on the feet. It's just, I don't think it's that much of a factor i think I, yeah i think he's got a lot left on his like a lot, a lot left um on the track i guess yeah fair enough um okay so here's like a bit of a weird question your last fight against matt Schnell, it was in the apex phenomenal win but it was in the apex and so i never know how it works with australian fighters obviously once you get to the level of a volk or even in this case um, a Jack De La Maddalena, they're going to put you, you're fighting the very top guys in that division, top five kind of guys or whatever. They're going to put you on a big pay-per-view card in all likelihood. Some of these fights will be in the States. And I wonder for you, are you, if, if the title fight doesn't come, so let's, let's imagine for whatever reason that's <coughs> not going to be next. Does the UFC ever make it a place where they're like, hey, we want to get you ready for a fight, but we're going to save you until we come to Australia. Do you have a say in that? I guess what I'm trying to figure out is to what extent is what's your priority fighting in australia you don't care uh whoever the next best guy is how quick it is wh wh where do these things what is, how do you balance all of these competing interests so i feel like i don't necessarily get that much say i mean i could have a lot more say than i have but i don't really talk to the usd my managers do that for me and again like i said before i'm like an anybody anywhere anytime type of person so they come to me and they say, do you want to fight this guy? And I say, yes. And that's sort of the extent. Um, that's that's the entire people. conversation. You never say, <laughs> hey, man, I want to fight in Perth or uh, get me back out there as fast as humanly possible. Don't care. Uh, to your point, don't care. It's really just a question of like when it happens, it happens is what it sounds like. Yeah. I mean, obviously, after the fight, I like I'm, I make a point of saying who I want. So after the Dvorak fight, I said I want Schnell. That's who I think would be a great fight next. Just so... Again, I don't have to have the conversation, but the UFC goes, oh, okay, well, maybe we'll see what that can happen. Or if they think that's ridiculous, then they can make whatever they want. But at least I've made myself known. This one, I said, I want Moreno. So if they think that's a good fight, which obviously I think it is, 
they can decide where would it be best here would it be best there it doesn't make sense all that sort of stuff so they know what i want anyway i think and yeah it's up to them at the end of the day all right i'm gonna say a name tell me their biggest weakness here we go ready brandon moreno wrestling okay uh manel cop wrestling <laughs> okay <laughs> there might might be a theme here uh brandon royville <laughs> wrestling okay all right how about this one here we go a bit of a wild card he's injured but you know we're gonna ask just the same amir albazi yeah that's a good one um i think distance is his biggest weakness getting inside my range will be hard for him do you watch a lot of tape i know you watch fights but i guess i'm not asking that i'm asking the art of breaking it down frame by frame. Here's what he does. Here's what he doesn't do. That kind of thing. Yeah, I I definitely do. I've I'm sort of in a weird spot where it's like I like the idea of Floyd Mayweather. It's like, well, I make good enough reads and that sort of thing in the fight. And sometimes getting too focused on the opponent can be a bad thing. So don't watch tape. Leave it to your coaches and then sort of make the reads on the night. And then I do break things down well. I think so watching and really getting a good eye in a, of what they do myself. Um, I usually end up going, watching the tape and breaking it down myself. But if I do choose to go the other way, I know that my coaches are very good at what they do and they'll implement drills and stuff to make sure that I'm fully prepared to take advantage of whatever their weaknesses are, even without me having to look at it. Uh, how easy is it for you to make 125? And I'll be curious, especially coming all the way to the United States and everything, were there any challenges <laughs> with that? No, nah, not really. I mean, I don't feel like I'm a massive flyweight, but then I see some of the numbers and then I'm like, oh, maybe I am slightly bigger than average. Uh, I'm not really sure. I feel like I could cut quite a bit more. So, but yeah, oh, really? no, yeah, no uh, dramas um, cutting weight. The PI makes it very, a lot easier than it used to be. Yeah, I was going to say, like, there's not, at 28, this is not one of those things where it's like, well, I've got like two fights left at flyweight and then I'm up to bantamweight. That's not what you're saying, right? No, nah, definitely not. I could fight there yeah. forever. Hey, man, as a fan of the fight game, <clears throat> boxing, MMA, anything, um, who are fighters that you just really have loved to watch over the years? Um, so, like, the classic ones are, like, Muhammad Ali, Floyd Mayweather, Roy Jones. Um, a huge fan of Jose Aldo. He's, yeah, one of my favorite fighters of all time. I love people who are really skilled, mostly, like... Um, who would I say in MMA is really obviously Volkanovski, amazingly skillful. Um, Matt Holloway, very skillful. Uh, Conor McGregor gets a lot of flack, but he's unbelievably skillful. Uh, I just like people that aren't just tough because everybody's tough. People that are like really thoughtful and um, really break it down and make it uh, a system, I guess. George St. Pierre, amazing. That's what yeah. I think. Yeah, uh, the Floyd Mayweather one is interesting. Talk about making adjustments, but it's such a different sport, right? I mean, the guy has 11 breaks to figure out what kind of adjustments he wants. In an MMA fight, you get, well, you, if it's a title fight, you get more. But in, in, in most cases for you right now, it's just going to be two, two different breaks in order to make changes. That's tough. That's a tough act to follow. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you don't necessarily just make bre- uh, changes during breaks. You can make changes during rounds. So it's not... It's not that different. I mean, if I miss two right hands and I was lunging on, on them, but I was very close to landing, it's like, well, I know that now I'm not lunging on the right hand. I'm throwing a very disciplined right hand, but the onus is on me to make sure my feet are in the right spot. So I don't have to follow up with a double jab and then land whatever after that. It's just, you make it in the fight, not just through the rounds. I know, you're saying this, <clears throat> you're saying this, and I, I certainly believe you and I've seen it. You know, I mean, there's, this is, there's plenty of real, real world evidence, but... My humble opinion, good fighters can make adjustments between rounds, especially if they have good cornering, right? Hey, we need you to tighten this up, blah, 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 right? Uh, it takes a great fighter to make adjustment in between rounds, like really meaningful, quick adjustments. It's like You're saying it like you can do it, and I believe you, you can, no <laughs> doubt about it. No, don't, don't, yeah. Please don't misunderstand me. I 100% yeah. believe you, but I just want, I would push back a little bit and say, I don't think many fighters have that skill, to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Um, <laughs> some, yeah, I don't know. Some fighters are just good fighters, I guess, and they get a long way on their athleticism and 
that sort of thing. And then some people uh, get by on their mind and then some people have both. Um, I like to think that I've got some degree of athleticism and I think most of it is based on my mind. So, um, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Um, hey, just for, some, for those of us who are not there in Australia, just very quickly, can you give us a sense in the last five years or so, the growth of MMA? How Exactly how popular is it? Is it popular through the entire country? Is it just certain parts? Where does it rank amongst other sports? Give me a sense, please. Um, yeah, over the last five years, definitely grown heaps. There's lots of people that don't know what the UFC is still. Um, but, no, it's massive. I think AFL which is Australian rules football. Um, mm -hmm. That's in WA. It'd be the most popular sport still probably. And then over East in like Sydney and stuff, NRL is massive. Um, but UFC is definitely the top three. Cricket's there too. I don't like cricket, so I'm always going to like downplay how popular <laughs> that is. But people do love cricket, so... Yeah, well, good yeah. good news. Americans don't give a fuck about cricket either. So you have, you <laughs> yeah. have good company. Yeah. Uh, but last thing on this, Tim Zhu, is he? What's his level of uh, uh, like national awareness? Oh, he's huge. Yeah. Um, okay. I think nobody really watches boxing until there's a massive fight, and then everybody's a boxing fan over here. Like the Floyd Mayweather Pacquiao thing. There's all these people coming up to me because I was obviously a boxing fan. And they're like, oh, are you going to watch this fight? I'm like, I didn't even know you knew what boxing was. So, so people just like big events. And yeah, Tim Zoo, because obviously he's Australian, won a world title and he looks like yeah, son of Costa Zoo, like all that sort of stuff. People are, um, mo a lot of people know who he is. But, yeah. Uh, well, well, I got to tell you, you keep turning in performances like you did against Matt Schnell. People are going to have a very similar opinion of you. Super, super, super impressive, man. Really, really blew my socks off. I was very, very impressed with just the quality of movement, the quality of skill. Uh, the, you could tell you were thinking in there. You could tell you were calm and making good decisions. It was super impressive. So I really appreciate your time. I'm glad I got, got this opportunity to speak. And um, I don't know if you're going to get a title fight next. But whatever happens next, I'll be watching, man. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me as well.